center of CUNY. It uh, looks like we are sliding slowly into the summer and it's a beautiful day again here in New York City after that really tough, horrible winter and uh, early spring that seemed to be cold and, um, and uh, not yet um, out there. And there's signs on the streets your good people are walking around, most actually with masks, even so officially we do not have them. They are the first uh, performances uh, um, that uh, people can attend to any hamburger um, uh, just uh, uh, pro promo opened some of her uh, productions. Um, again, she was here with us um, on the um, on the Siegel talk. So this is um, uh, great signs of life. Things in the parks are happening unorganized, and um, and we all hope um, that this will be the turn of the corner, at least in the U.S. Uh, we have devastating news, of course, from India, as we heard last week, and. Uh, from, from, from other places and we do not know what will happen if the Broadway will open in this September, if it's possible in such a short time. But um, we all do think there will be again uh, live performances here, which had been all the time already in France, Germany and other countries, but um, not in the US. It was really, really, really close as Professor Marvin Kelson reminded us. Even in the time of Shakespeare, when uh, there was the plague, London theater companies could go outside London and perform in smaller towns. This was not possible. He is a complete shutdown. It's been unprecedented. And we are still dealing with that. And it has changed so much, perhaps almost for four, two years. There has been interruption in going to theater, thinking about theater. And, uh, and as many artists said here, it has also uh, been important to have a time of reflection, a time to um, understand where we come from, where we are going to. And it's now about what are we going to do what was to what to do, uh, Lenin said famously, and uh, this is now what we all have to think anew in the world we live in. And, and with us, we have artists, and they often and always, I think, on the right side of history, on the right side of the struggle for freedom and democracy, they uh, live really in the moment uh, and not in the past and anticipate often the future and uh, what lies ahead combining existing traditional forms like performance, theater, music, opera with new digital media, the new media, and then something happens and catastrophes like the corona uh, time um, are a part of uh, what will uh, bring change like and so many people said here of, like after World War II when the Edinburgh Festival got founded, the theater festival in Avignon, we hope this is also a time where things will change differently. We are thinking and creating a park project, an international festival here in New York City, and we need a lot of help. So we really want to listen and hear what's working, what's not working from all around the world. And today we have a very significant reason. Uh, it's a very significant region with us here, a region that has been uh, part of the world map of theater with a long, a long tradition. Even so, it was sailing under different flags, uh, often under a Russian one and uh, or Soviet Union one, but now again, uh, under our own flags is the Baltic region, which we have uh, uh, with us here today. And so we uh, welcome Anna Ablamonova and Dr. Gora Parasid, uh, uh, both uh, young emerging and mid-career artists and, and presenters who have done a remarkable job, uh, is stunning uh, work in a country, Lithuania, which has a long, long and significant um, um, uh, uh, history of theater. And we do not know enough about it. We should know much more. It's very alive and especially the opera scene. So um, Anna and uh, Jin, welcome to the Siegel Talks. Hey, hello. Hello. It's all about listening. We have to listen to the artists. And then I go on and on and on. But sometimes I think this is good because what I say is slightly boring, perhaps, and then it will create a bit more excitement when you finally come up. Where are you both and what time is it? It's like uh, seven, four past seven, and I'm in Kaunas, which is the second biggest city in Lithuania. I'm in Vilnius and it's at the same time. Uh, Vilnius is the first uh, city, capital. Yeah, and I am at the very center of the city right now. Mm -hmm. So it used to be Vilna, now it's called Vilnos, Vilna in the second world, but now it's called Vilnos. Maybe, um, Anna, tell us a little bit about the city. Where is it located? And a little bit about the history so we get an idea where you guys are. 
uh, it's located uh, in Lithuania, and Lithuania is uh, located uh, beside the Baltic uh, Sea, uh, close to Scandinavian countries. And uh, we have a lot of neighbors, Belarus, a little bit of Russia, Latvia. So quite uh, interesting region. And uh, talking about history, maybe important to mention that uh, in two years, we will celebrate 700 years of the city. So it's quite uh, uh, interesting, uh, interesting place with very interesting history, interesting architecture, Baroque architecture mostly, and uh, very old university and uh, very wide uh, performing arts scene, I would say, but uh, maybe it would, uh, uh, would be good to say uh, that we have interesting scene, not only in Vilnius, but also in Kaunas, which will be a European capital of culture next year. Uh, we will celebrate another, another, uh, and create and uh, have another big project. So it's really nice, tiny, small country with very interesting things happening around. Fantastic. Um, let me just uh, tell our viewers a little bit uh, about um, both of you. Um, Anna is the founder and producer of Opermania. Opermania again. Yeah. Did I pronounce it right? Operomania. Operomania. Ah, and it's a production house in Lithuania dedicated to the creation promotion of new music theater through cross-disciplinary artistic uh, collaborations. And uh, since uh, 2008, she has produced uh, over, over 50, five zero, contemporary operas and uh, various artistic projects. And these are all new operas, a lot of them. So um, something that would even make the Met very proud. And my guess is she had more female composers there than the Met who made such a big, a big promotion that finally we have a living female for the first time ever at the Met. And um, it's, I thought it's nothing to be proud of. I think the work of what you guys do um, is, uh, is of a real um, importance. So there are many, many um, um, works for opera also with the Vilna Ghetto uh, connected to site specific work. And it is one of the leading international new music theater places in the Baltic region. And importantly, also for us, since we are here at the Graduate Center CUNY, the great Graduate Center, um, Anna also serves as the head of the Art Center at the Lithuanian Academy of uh, Music and Theater. So this is a great way to connect if anybody wants to, you know, so this is great. And then we have with us um, Jin Tara, Jin, Dr. Gora Parasit, this is her working name, her um, nom de guerre, or nom de plume, however you want it, as a their artist name. And she is a, a digital theater performance, experimental film, and music director. She's a lecturer, methodologist, designer, and a member of WIF, uh, Women in Film, and uh, part of the Lithuanian Interdisciplinary Artist um, Organizations. She uh, has really an interest of what everybody kind of talks about, and we all talk about interdisciplinary work, combining um, and new uh, technologies, and her artistic and aesthetical interests lie in the depth of the net, the internet, the act of browsing in itself, and in an infinite cognitive journey of collecting and identifying audiovisual experiences by which one learns about the world, and through which they create a sense of self and a collective identity. And um, she uh, uh, tends uh, to combine performance, cinema, theater, opera, neuroscience, digital culture in this expressive aesthetic language and that is screaming um, foreign attention and our daily lives visually overloaded the uh, digital reality. She tries to compress that in her work. And I think it is interesting, it's stunning. It is new work. She has won many awards just recently, one of the best music videos she put out, she got a big award. And so uh, thank you both again for being um, with us. And uh, so um, Jen, tell us a little bit about your town. Uh, Anna said it's also uh, um, culturally um, on the map. Yeah, it is culturally on the map. Um, it's a small, it's the smallest town in Vilnius. And as Anna mentioned, uh, we are European culture capital in 2022. Yeah, and uh, so we're gonna have lots of uh, uh, things happening. 
So historically, architecture is beautiful. We have lots of medieval architecture also, as Vilnius also, Anna mentioned Baroque, but we have medieval beauties, churches. Uh, like Anne's church in Vilnius, we have the Svitotas church. Um, so I don't know, shall I tell you population? <laughs> It's a beautiful city worth visiting and the culture is getting really, really strong here. I love Kolnes very much. So I was born here in this really old Jewish hospital uh, in 1984. And uh, since then, I'm totally dedicated to the city. Yeah, so. Fantastic. And it's a big deal to be uh, Italian, uh, a European capital, cultural capital of the year. I think it was Madeira in Italy before. and. Uh, uh, Berlin is a very significant thing. How is, how is it going? How is the situation with Corona at the moment? It's getting better, Anna, yes. I must say Yeah, it, it's getting better, though statistics are not so good as we had at the same time last year. But we are much more brave than previous year. And uh, despite of the statistics, we have possibility to make events already and to have uh, some spectators. We have restrictions, but, but still we can have around 30% of, uh, of the capacity of the venues. We can make, uh, make performances outside. And so it's slightly moving forward. And I, I hope it will get better because the vaccination process is uh, quite fast, I would say here in, in Lithuania. So numbers are worse than last year, but people are getting vaccinated. And theaters are open since when? So 30%? Uh, since uh, uh, last month, maybe, I think. Yeah, since, maybe since the very end of April, something mm -hmm. like that. We started mm -hmm. our events uh, about uh, one week ago. So, and that opening of the venues was quite uh, unpredictable just uh, government announced that you can make uh, events starting from next Monday, but nobody was prepared for that. So it took some time to organize everything, to plan, to plan schedules, to sell tickets. And uh, that's why all that movement of events started maybe uh, at the beginning of May, second week of May. Yeah, and it's getting better, I would say. Hmm, that is good. So how does it work? Um, can you afford it? Can you play for 30%? Uh, I think that most of, uh, most of uh, non-commercial artists, they can do this because uh, uh, they cover all their expenses, uh, having support from the government partly, and another part it is uh, ticket sales. So we do not have to rely on ticket sales only. That is a, a European system. We have some support from the government and that helps us to, to keep going and to perform our events, our performances uh, for such a small audience. Yeah, But of course, those who organize uh, uh, some big events in arenas uh, and they do not have government support. Uh, they are struggling. They are still struggling. Mm. Someone said it's only war is more expensive than opera. And of course we love opera. <laughs> uh, so um, um, do you think, uh, it, does it, the moment right now, will it be much more complicated for you to do work? Or do you think once it's over, or let's say everybody's vaccinated, you will go on like it was? Will there be changes? I think there will be changes. There are already some changes. I think most of the changes happened in our heads. Because uh, uh, I started thinking if we should uh, do so many work, if maybe we should do less and to think, uh, uh, to think a lot about what we are doing. Because I think it was uh, market, theater market was overdosed with all kinds kind of art. I think we should do less and to think more about quality, about what we are doing, what we are offering. So it was a very interesting time of challenges, uh, challenges dealing with uh, all the restrictions, uh, uh, with the COVID, uh, with, uh, with 
everything. But uh, besides, that was a good time to think about what we are doing in general. Yeah, and I think it will make a difference. In the, it, it already makes different. Mm -hmm. Difference. And I want to ask a question to you before we also go to Jim. Um, we are very concerned what will happen. Will people come? Um, when you opened, you, know, you said a week ago, uh, did people come? Did tickets sell or are people hesitant? Um, how, what is the experience? Uh, actually, uh, I discovered our audience again and I'm in love with our audience because uh, I think that that was a huge support for us they they bought all the tickets we were selling so it's not a problem P people want to have that real experience of performing arts and they uh, they buy tickets uh, of course, habits a bit different. They're not buying tickets uh, several months in, in advance. Uh, normally it happens now like one week or 10 days in advance or like five days. And it, it uh, um, uh, and uh, due to this reason, uh, it is complicated for us to plan everything. For instance, to plan more events, we have to be first in our reactions but uh, in general, uh, this pandemic helped me to rediscover our audience and to understand that they are really interested in this art that we are producing, creating. And um, yeah, I think uh, it, it, nothing changed. Maybe even we are much more in love, if I can say so, with the audience. That's fantastic. Um... Uh, Jin, um, how did you experience um, this last year and the moment as an artist? Uh, it was interesting because I am as an artist, I can take a lot and maybe it's bad or good, I don't know. But uh, I also experienced pandemic as I also experienced overload of work. So I don't really know, I can't decide, was I really in quarantine or was I working over too much? You know, is it online digital work and the studio work? everything to arrange around so the performance happens you know uh, in Lithuania we had less restrictions than in Germany and other countries in summer then we had massive restriction really strong and uh, strict in in winter and again we kind of allowing people to come to performances so we had a chance to show a couple of works in end of the summer in Berlin outdoors in the Lido uh, like in the next to the lake and then one outdoors in, in Lithuania, you know, but uh, the work becomes much uh, harder in sense of organizing everything and thinking, is it gonna happen? One actor is gonna get sick, then the whole crew can't perform, you know, and then you're looking for different means of telling the story instead of showing the live performance. So the second show with the TikTok Shakespeare in Lithuania, we filmed the whole performance on the video and we showed it on a LED screen but the actors were present next to the stage. And if any of them would get sick or would not be available to be a part of the presence next to the stage, they would be present online next to the stage, next to LED screen. So I guess instead of thinking, because well, I'm not an institutional artist, I'm not, uh, I'm not working for a national theater or opera houses. So for us, it's a little bit different because we are always experiencing this coming in doing the show, wrapping everything up and leaving, you know? So we always on this kind of a traveling mode and not knowing what's, what's gonna happen. You're gonna get project funded or not. So it's in that, in that terms, nothing really changed. It just slow, slow down the things and st you started to think and appreciate time more. And what Anna says, it's a really good thing. I really started to appreciate time. I really want to devote more time for the art I do. And uh, this period just made me to think about it so much. And yes, I think theater was overloaded with all sorts of projects and uh, which uh, sadly to say, some of them don't really have like so strong value, you know, and I think time is a key for all of it. Regarding our audience, yeah, everything changed. It's different. For example, I'm doing show now in Comus in September and we have to do more shows than one or two because the audience is divided to smaller groups so you are you are you're doing more premieres than you used to before because to 
take the whole number of the audience that it used to be to come to the one or two shows before the pandemics. So, and uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess it, it, it felt, but it also it was overload of everything. Internet, also thinking about this digital transition. Uh, we talked with Anna before about this presence online to be always online. Okay, you're off the line, but maybe if you have your opera mania, you know, running your company, which has to be reach the audience all the time. Do you need to be on Instagram, on Facebook all the time? I like to do these things sometimes. I always, I'll get tired, but I know many people like truly don't like this online presence. And that's the key question. Do we transition to online or not? And uh, I think that was like kind of forced moment for artists to think about this transitional technological moment because we will have to think about this eventually because it's taking over everything. And we, ha we have to know the tools in order to know what we're fighting with, what we have to deal in the future with, I, I, I think. So this was a lot of uh, information uh, I kind of was capable to take in on myself and uh, still think which way to go and uh, what's the best way and finding the, you know, the, um, the niche for this. For example, we're doing a premiere in Mars uh, in two months. We're doing a performance show in Mars in VR. And I found it very fascinating, the whole idea of this. The planet Mars. Yeah, yeah, it's virtual reality. You know, this all Astro thing, you know, these monopolies taking over, you know, all the, uh, all the space, you know, why we as an artist can't take a bit of it, you know, and, uh, you know, this kind of fiction that fake it till you make it. And I want to be part of this, you know, why not just to play around all of this. So yeah, there's lots of things. At the same time, this constant idea of like uh, countries who are not able to um, perform well in order to say, make people secure and safe, uh, you know, like Brazil and, uh, and many other countries, you know. And uh, so, so many, many, many thoughts, you know, lots of responsibilities, future thinking, past thinking. Hmm. Hmm. That, is, that is truly interesting that um, you develop work that somehow now plays on Mars, that not only you leave your local or the global community, even though they are both connected and now, and you say, let's go interstellar and um, do what the big companies think about or NASA though. Um, so let me go back to your opera works. You said you project, you had the live opera, the actors were in the room, but if someone got sick, is his or her part would be projected? It's not an opera first, it's, it's a theatrical play. Uh, yeah. It's Shakespeare, the, the comedy of errors. In and TikTok, you said Shakespeare, a tick? Talk yes, or? TikTok Shakespeare. We were we were researching TikTok platform and the appearances of it, you know, and how it affects us and our brain and how we can transform to these artificial and in, artificial intelligence or like algorithms to of TikTok, some of the uh, traditional theater kind of. Uh, but uh, it needs time for this. We have to make a big research because this this platform is nasty and it's so smart in a sense, and and it's not pleasant to work with you know, constantly actors got really tired. But the idea of your question was the screen and the presence, uh, the actor in the theater play had to be present on the stage. While with all these uh, insecurities about getting sick, even, you know, running nose or getting fever, even though it's not COVID, you know, you have, a, you have to close all the team until you get the results of the actor or someone from the team, you know, negative ans answer from the from the lab. So, it, and it was uh, fair of me because we planned the whole, you know, rehearsals and, uh, and, and the premiere, all the money is there and the dates. And I was, we were very scared that someone might get ill. And then we transformed the whole play on the screen. Uh, and the screen reflected a mobile screen. It was vertical, not horizontal. So it was, uh, mm. and the actors were present next to the stage all the time online. Uh, project in life of them being next to the next to the performance and we thought about this idea if someone gets sick they will still be present next to stage online in ipad or computer or mobile they will be somewhere at home but present online 
So that was the transition between the digital theater to, from the theater to the digital theater. So I very... saw actions on stage, but also on a big projection in landscape format at the same time. They could choose. Yeah. yeah. How, did that, how did that work? Uh, well, it worked, you know, the, it, the, the, the play was on the screen, you know, and uh, the actors were present on the stage. That was the kind of a performative, like very open transition between the theater and the uh, digital theater. It needs development, I guess, you know, you can play with this a lot. I mean, there's so much theater plays online. People got so creative during the COVID. You can see the whole Shakespearean plays, you know, people doing it on Zoom all the orchestra doing their performances on Zoom, you know? So it's not only, you know, this, there was so much development in this, you know? So uh, just an example that people can adapt and transform and, you know, all this interdisciplinarity. And I think um, it was just a, as a playground, you know, to try out if it works, you know? But I think in Lithuania, it was a very important moment where the, their traditional theater kind of got shook a bit, you know? and uh, started to kind of question, okay, maybe that's the time to ex accept, you know, these all individuals who are working outside the theater. And, you know, I think, I don't know how far they've gone with the thought of the merging artist, not, in, not in institutional, but I think there will be some kind of more respect in the sense and talk. And I think Anna even mentioned that uh, there were talks about, uh, in the governmental kind of a section with the, with the funding, what concerns those independent artists like you, like of Romania, no? Um, you know, uh, just governmental theaters, they normally uh, have support and uh, ticket sales, uh, it is a small part of their incomes. So they have, uh, they have money to do their work. And uh, as uh, Gintari mentioned, those independent artists, when they do work, they always are uh, in such situa situation where, where they do not know if they will, will have money to do the art. But in, uh, uh, in context of pandemic, uh, uh, it became clear that these independent artists need, uh, need uh, much more support. And there were some programs started for that. So yeah, and I hope that that attention to independence scene will stay after pandemics. Mm, so something is changing. Something was already as recognized. Um, and I'll be poor, I back to you, um, uh, Jin, a question. You worked in film and in the digital realm uh, before your interest in neuroscience, the brain, visual receptions and how it works. Um, did it prepare you for that time of uh, Corona? Um, did you continue what you were doing or did you discover something new? Uh, yeah, of course, because uh, the methodologies what I'm, what I'm working with actors allows us to, to work distantly. Uh, we can work online. We always were rehearsing online before pandemics and that's not a struggle to do this again. Just the question of representation. If you do the live show before rehearsing online and doing like a few days a week before rehearsals of the live show, you have to do it more on the screen, you know, or even adapt the whole play for the video, you know, so that changed. But everything that we kind of uh, were doing and explo explo exploring and the neuroscience methodology allows us to work online and there's no need of tactile experience with the director and the actor, you know, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it was uh, uh, just one step on a journey you were already on, but kind of a confirmation that what you do actually has value, is important, significant, and is being taken more serious. I don't know how serious it is, but I know that it helps me a lot now. Like, it seems like uh, it just came naturally, you know, the, the work online. But I think many artists, you know, because we're so global, you know, and we, we, we're so international in a sense. Anna works with so much international, so many international artists. I'm sure there were few rehearsals that were kept online, you know, and uh, you have to adapt this adaptation, you know, constant adaptation. And it's just, I never thought that I would experience theater changing so much. And uh, I always thought that I overlived this time, 
what I'm experiencing it to be kind of a, in a sense, digitalized and changed and uh, audiences also, you know, I, you know, who knows? I hope there's not gonna be another, you know, pandemic or, but uh, yeah. And you worked all the, you said, I don't, you didn't even feel uh, the Corona time. I was not isolated. I always worked. You felt, if not, it was even more work. So for you, it was a, a working, a strong working experience that year. Yeah, if it's not live, so it's online. You know, there was, I realized that there was so much projects that keep going after me that you have to really finish. But I think the whole fair was, uh, parents and relatives and friends around you know and there's so much uh, news on, on on the television that like really freaks people out and i've noticed my family members who watches lots of tv they, they just become very paranoid you know and i hate media i do hate it and uh, yeah yeah so um how, how so very different of an experience than from let's say new york um, artist. Um, Anna, let's talk a little bit about your opera, opera Man, Manija, op, if I say it right. Um, we hear so much about it. It's such a life center. What, what is your work about? Why is it different from others? Uh, this is uh, an independent, I think we hear echo, yeah. no? Yeah. Well. Um, uh, this is an independent company which was uh, founded uh, 14 years ago and uh, it's different because it is quite unique. Uh, just imagine an uh, opera company uh, which pr uh, produced around 50 productions, new operas, and it well, has me and... Opera was new. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, we have me as a pro producer, director, and also accountant manager. And this is it, what we have. And for all the productions that we need, we hire all the people who are needed for all, the, all different ideas. And we collaborate with the many independent artists. So we are not uh, connected with any venue. We do not have any space. We are not connected with any ensemble. And uh, in a way, it's complicated to work this way. But uh, I feel a huge uh, freedom in that. And I think that it helps us to rethink opera genre, to uh, come back to opera's roots. Because uh, if we remember etymology of the word opera, what is opera? It is work. It is something something which is done by different uh, people. And um, uh, so this is different because most of, uh, most of uh, context where you can see opera, normally it is opera house with existing stage orchestra kit, ensemble uh, orchestra. And it's something that, uh, that uh, 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 shows the path how to create opera. When we do not have anything, we can go anywhere and create our own operas. Maybe later we will uh, we'll find uh, some specific titles for these pieces. For instance, comic strip opera, which we have done with uh, uh, Gintaria, uh, or uh, dance opera, or a spatial opera in the dark, or opera performance, opera art installation, or even we can uh, avoid the word uh, opera. So uh, I think it's very different company. Maybe for those who are familiar with the uh, American uh, performing arts scene, it's something like Beth Morrison projects. We are joking that uh, Opera Mania is Lithuanian version of Beth Morrison projects. And uh, we uh, work kind of similar way. And uh, the main, uh, the main uh, aim of our work is uh, artistic discovery to uh, create something that was never created anywhere. And I think uh, sometimes we're struggling, sometimes it is difficult, but when we get those discoveries, artistic discoveries, that is the best motivation. 
for us to uh, keep going and to develop this uh, field of art, contemporary opera or new music theater. Yes, and uh, uh, we started uh, uh, 13 or already 14 years ago organizing uh, contemporary opera festival, NOAA, New Opera Action, but when we were really very young people, a group of artists and me, and uh, later we started uh, uh, touring abroad and that helped us a lot because it was complicated to develop uh, this genre and develop organization working in Lithuania only. But now uh, we are aiming on uh, developing uh, repertoire locally uh, to, to do some other works, residencies, uh, release uh, our recordings, uh, may even some books, and uh, that these activities are very wide. Yeah, uh, uh, did I answer your question? No, perfect. Maybe say one <laughs> or two or three, or two. what are examples? What did you do? What was different, like projects? Okay. Uh, I, I will remember them in connection with the pandemics. For instance, we have a, a produced uh, opera for 10 singing cashiers, supermarket sounds and piano. Opera is yeah, called Have a Good so Day. That, so it's in Corona time. You, you continued producing in the time of Corona. And this is for 10 I, people I, who I, supermarket and I, cash register. I, I continued to produce during times of Corona, but this specific piece was premiered much earlier and we have performed it in New York at, at Here Art Center in the context of Prototype Festival. And uh, this piece is for just for 10 singers uh, who act as cashiers at the supermarket. Uh, there is also one pianist, jazz pianist, who acts uh, as a security guard and uh, supermarket sounds. Yes, and, is, it uh, this... or is it in a supermarket, site specific, or on a stage? Normally, it happens on the stage in the gallery, white box, or we uh, perform it in the black box uh, venue and we turn it into semi white box. Uh, by the way, in here Art Center, all the space was uh, painted white for us. Uh, it was white, yeah. And uh, this was uh, that piece which opened up for us uh, all the possibilities uh, and the international uh, uh, market. Uh, uh, and we started touring and uh, Maybe important to mention that uh, creators of this piece, uh, that was their first uh, collaborative pr project, uh, first opera they did, uh, and second opera they uh, created uh, not in cooperation with our production house, but still uh, their second work, opera performance Sun and Sea. It was um, uh, presented two years ago in Venice Biennale and got uh, a golden, Line. Line. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you saw it. Yeah, people were lying uh, on the floor in kind of a fake beach pretending to have a beautiful yes, yes. summer, but actually it was all fake uh, uh, environment. You would be upstairs you know, on a balcony looking down on people once in a while, almost spontaneously starting to sing about the experience. You would see dogs running around, kids playing. It was a very beautiful and also disturbing thing. So that amazing that you gave that company the first chance. Yeah, fantastic. And, and you did also something yeah, and, in the, yeah, go on. And we're still, we still touring with that Have a Good Day opera. You know, it, it was performed already for 70 times and it's quite a number for contemporary opera in Lithuanian context. And what is also interesting to mention, for instance, last year, it was, of course, sold out, especially after Venice Biennale, Golden Lion. All the performances of opera Have a Good Day are sold out just in a few moments. We put yeah. tickets for four performances online and it is sold out. And uh, after we uh, got sold out, uh, we had to cancel performances. We postponed them to September. And in September, we had new regulations. We had to have 
one or two, I don't remember how many meters in between spectators. So we had to add additional performances to communicate with all the spectators who already bought tickets and to make five operas performances in 27 hours. That was, that was quite a challenge, and, uh, but we survived. So that was the reality of the pandemics. And for instance, another show we did together with Gintare, it's called the uh, comic strip opera Alpha uh, for two singers, Paris, one actor. Dr. Gora Paris, who's Dr. Gintare. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. fine. <laughs> Sorry. Dr. Okay. Gora Parasit, who, who, uh, who acts in that opera as a, a director, set designer, uh, costume designer, and all possible, uh, all other possible designers. Yeah, and it was, uh, and it is still very interesting connection uh, between opera and comic strips both genres which are very expressive and uh, we had very interesting result. And we, we are going with this performance to, to Prague, to Czech Republic. So we hope that uh, this tour will not be canceled and we will uh, keep going with the performances and with tours. And another uh, different productions, quite different to what I have mentioned. It is a comic, uh, not comic, but sonic experience uh, in the former Vilna ghetto. Uh, it's called Glaistos. Uh, uh, in English, we call it filler. And uh, this performance is uh, designed for five spectators only, which uh, are uh, going through the ghetto uh, together with two guides. Um, and uh, they have only headphones and natural scenography, scenography of the city, which uh, still have some left over from the, uh, from the ghetto times. And by the way, this uh, format of this performance was uh, uh, very good for the pandemics. And we had chance last year to perform it for more than 100 times and already started doing it this year. Yeah, so these are performances we do, they are quite different and we have much more different performances, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, we need time to, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about them. That's, that's good. Yeah, I think we had uh, Lucien with us who runs the Invisible Dog at Brooklyn and Arts and Money said, you know, like in the old fables from La Fontaine, a big tree in a storm might fall faster you know, than the, than the reef or the grass. The grass can move, you know, it goes with the movement and it will, will be there. And what we are seeing here in New York uh, uh, is that they fell or, or we haven't heard anything really on the stages of Lincoln Center, for example, the opera. Why isn't there anything happening even in a small way? Um, and then tell you, we, we, we don't understand. And, and we are also all a little bit uh, shocked by it, but we hear they, make fundraising for, we love that, of course, the Lincoln Center, it's an important place. And, and it's, I'm just mentioning it for, also for many others. And, um, but it's, we wonder how much care did they take of the artist and uh, the institution comes first, I guess, and also in fundraising, but something is wrong and a small company, a small uh, unit, a mobile unit with a vision and experience, how to make some sort of, you, you did something and it's fantastic. Um, uh, Jin I or Jin Tari, uh, or Dr. Gora Parra said, uh, all of you three, uh, um, um, you also did a work in the Vilnius uh, get ghetto, if I understand right. How was that, how did that go? What did you do and how did it, was it perceived? In Vilnius ghetto? We, yeah. we, no, we didn't do it. It's, it's a new Anna's production production that's, that's been successful in show before first pandemic, right, Anna? And, uh, and another I remember yeah, you did we, do we we just premiered it before the pandemic, but it was uh, very <laughs> perfect. It was perfect timing for the premiere. Yeah. But we didn't do it especially for the pandemic. Yeah. I, I thought you did a video project or you filmed or you did some work um, also. Uh, uh, we did in, uh, in, in, in museum in Ninth Forest in Kaunas a uh, music video of a hip hop band in Lithuania talking about the victims of the Second World War through the hip hop. 
Uh, it was a big adventure in the sense of a choice uh, of the music and the medium to talk through and the place to shoot the music video. In the sense that I was very, uh, when I came back after living in London for 10 years, I came back to Lithuania and I, I, that place in Kaunas, the museum of uh, Holocaust was always, uh, you know, like uh, a place of my memory when I was a child because we used to go there with the school and uh, teacher used to tell us the stories and so on and so forth. And he used to stay with me and I feel very big responsibility because I lived in the city. And when I came back, I was just talking with a few young actors and I realized they don't know the history at all and no one speaks and we call it sensitive theme uh, in a sense. And uh, I took this bold decision to make the music video. And the music video, a uh, track was talking about death and the place limbo between the death and life. And we decided to shoot it in there in the, in the, in the museum outside with a, with a special decision not to play music, uh, to do it in very silent uh, mode. Uh, we had a workshop for a week in my home with the actors talking about death and the history facts and uh, going through lots of methodology of what death means to you. And um, even we found this website uh, uh, where you can just put your your date of birth and you you can know when you're going to die and there was a choice of many not to and we were speaking about this human condition created by humans and why it's happening and I think this is the whole experience was very important in a sense there was lots of controversial ideas of people who saw it and they said how dare you play it with the hip-hop music but I say is it classical or hip hop? It doesn't matter. It, it really matters how much people are being reached and who is who is going to be reached and what you're talking about. So, mm. yeah. So that was a project. That was a long time ago. It was like 2015, maybe. And uh, it is not so long ago, but it seems such a long time ago. Um, mm. What? What are you watching, let's say in your region a bit more? Uh, what, what interesting things are happening? What, what do you hear from, uh, from, um, from Latvia, Romania, from uh, Russia, Belarus? Um, um, what uh, artists you follow? Maybe you tell us a little bit about your region, what, uh, who else you are in contact with. For example, me at the moment, we are we're kind of uh, making a project between Germany Belarus, Lithuania, Greece. I think other countries are combining in and we're talking about the idea of the European Center. What is this European Center? Because as we know, there's lots of uh, cities in uh, Europe that has European Center. And we here as an artist ought to decide which is the actual center. And uh, we think about this project of traveling through the cities. And uh, so we always meet and we talk about the, the difficult situations in Belarus, you know, and uh, you know, so, but as for art, we, I just don't know, I just watch things online, you know, there's so much, uh, you know, all the institutional houses that raised all the material online, which is wonderful. It used to be before, but uh, if you have a chance to see it live, you go see it live. If not, then you see it online. So, but art wise, uh, we're going to probably see artists because I'm interdisciplinary artists. I'm going to see lots of artists in Art Vilnius. We have this art fair in, in, in September. So we, you meet lots of galleries and lots of artists there. So I think that's going to be first time after a long time <laughs> meeting all this diverse community, you know, not online. Mm. Maybe you maybe come back, Anna. What do you? What inspires you? What did you see? What is there something in your region, but maybe even around the world? What What do you think? Uh, what moved you? What in this last year? What you saw? Um, what inspired you? To be honest, uh, I yeah, I try to to avoid uh, this uh, stream of live streams. Because uh, for me, it's exhausting. And for me, the most inspiring thing, what, what is happening around in the world, and I think that the biggest theater performance that we have for now, it's what is happening outside the theater, on the streets, or just watch the news each day. It's uh, the biggest inspiration, which uh, inspires me to think about. and. Um, uh, 
I see that it also affects uh, the works I produce. I don't know if it is connected, but uh, most of works that I have produced recently, they are connected with documentary materials, whether these are interviews with Litvaks who survived Holocaust and we did audio work with that, whether it is um, uh, documentary out, uh, video materials from Lithuanian national TV uh, during uh, uh, the times where, where Soviet Union collapsed. Yeah, now, now we are uh, developing one of the productions which is connected with the, the uh, Giuseppe Verdi's opera Traviata, because uh, last year we had one centenary uh, of Lithuanian uh, professional opera culture. And uh, uh, we have tradition in all the uh, state theaters, uh, which uh, stage or perform Traviata on December 20, uh, 31st. And uh, they have it as the biggest uh, fun uh, and uh, the biggest feast just to go and uh, see uh, Verdi's Traviata, although it's a really tragic story about courtesan, about uh, prostitutes, but people have fun and connected uh, with the uh, champagne and whatever. So I, I was very much confused well, when all the theaters decided to make premieres of Traviata last December. It doesn't happen due to Corona, but it inspired me to think why, why we are doing this. It's about the about prostitute and it's really sad story, but we are celebrating new year and having fun with beautiful dresses, drinking champagne. So uh, I really try to avoid the stream of, uh, of performing arts. Uh, I try to observe what is happening around in our lives and uh, and I find the uh, reactions through the performances to the facts which are happening in our lives, the most meaningful. Just for, for now, it's the most interesting and inspiring for me. And so do you read, read books or uh, go to a museum? Or? No, I, I, I read books. Uh, yeah. Uh, I recently, uh, I repeated Stefan Zweig, uh, European's uh, diary, and mm -hmm. uh, felt some parallels uh, which were in that book with nowadays. Yeah, I, I do that, but um, somehow real life is much more impressive and uh, inspiring. Uh, it forces me to question all the things which are happening around and to talk about those things through, through the art with the help of artists in collaboration with artists. Mm. How about you, Jim? Um, what, what, did, how did, what did you do to what inspiration? What did you look towards? Films. I can watch like 10 films a day. Uh, manga, anime. I watch lots of anime. It's amazing. Japanese, uh, Japanese. Yes, yes. I picked so much amazing methodology for uh, for acqu acquisition of the movement of the actor. It's incredible. I mean, there are scenes like the act, the animated anim character comes in into the room, and there's no open window. I don't know. That's so weird. And then because he has a very good haircut, there's a wind blows from somewhere from left to right. And then the haircut looks incredible. It has no like open space for the window. It's incredible, it's fantastic. So I picked up all these beautiful bits with no logic, you know, considering the situation of now that we live in total dislogic, you know, but, but you know, I thought about this situation, sorry for talking over, uh, about this pandemic situation. This is scary and it's tragic for the whole world, but at the same time, you know, this lockdown situation, this mentally lockdown situation, I am as an artist experiencing constantly, always, all these thoughts about these um, apocalyptic, you know, world changes and so on and so on. It's every day with me, you know, so I thought, okay, now welcome, you know, many of you to think, you know, about this existential things, you know, constantly every day and be forced to do this, you know. 
So all these illogical, irrational movie scenes, you know, anything that I read online, I, I made this big collection that I really like and make these connections with what's happening now, you know, and uh, what is, you know, asking myself, is this all right to go all this digital way? You know, what's happening with this digital art that takes over all the internet is so successful, people selling so much the artwork for so much, you know, all these cryptocurrencies. And, you know, it's a big question, like what's going to happen next, where all these forces come in. Today I read about uh, US military uh, developing drones for oiling the eggs of the birds around the uh, aircraft territories. So I thought, you know, birds are going to definitely fight for their nest. So there's going to be a war between the birds and drones, you know, I, I want to see the scene in a sense of my imagination, but it's horrible. So, oiling, you know, yes. what? For what? Yeah, there's going to be a drone that will detect the eggs and nest and they will oil the eggs so that they lose the pores and the, 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 the bird inside dies or it doesn't get, you know, uh, even um, progress into the any kind of a bodily shape. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, I imagine this apocalyptic scene, you know, we're fighting already with machines and there's a bear it's fighting with drones, you know. I was thinking about it like a year and a half ago and here you go. Yeah, so we have yeah. this. All this artificial intelligence, you know, this fear of singularity, you know, that all the machines are going to take over and this fear of, you know. Uh, um, so, two weeks in, in a German magazine, they pointed out that the very first time someone tried to write a poem, a novel, just through um, interface, you know, that was connected, you know, to, to yeah. it sounds like science fiction, uh, but it's someone who's paralyzed, who cannot communicate, and it did work, um, and it's at the very, very beginning, but it's the very first time that um, letters uh, could be combined. Um, yeah. We're thinking, I mean, this is just a, a stunning, a stunning uh, development, and we are so close, maybe we don't understand only later on one will know what really happened in this time and uh... but you know what i think yeah. there is a you, there is a theory of the time because if you if you have a clock which shows exact very very exact time it confuses lots of material from earth like lots of burns lots of uh, energy so the time used to, needs to go a little bit off in order to, to keep the whole planet safe, you know? So I'm thinking, you know, AI will, it will get it right, you know? It will maybe eventually in five years will write a novel book, you know? Like a novel price, it's gonna be so right that it's not gonna be right anymore, you know? And all these micro decisions that we as an artist can make, people, you know, in the sense, they will never be able to catch it up, you know, and that's how we will be able to trick out the AI, you know, in the, in the sense, I don't know, we just need to have the tools, an army of young, intelligent uh, coders, I don't know, I'm thinking of my sister, <laughs> but uh, you yeah. In, yeah, you have belief in the army of young, intelligent coders who will help us. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's not just uh, what we observe. I think there was the famous Wittgenstein experiment. There was a philosophy movement where was, they said, what you cannot really observe doesn't really exist. It was very serious in Vienna. And one day he came to the meeting, had a big clock, and then he put a cardboard in front of it and said, can you see the clock now? And they said, no, but he said, does time still pass? And they said, yes. And that was the end of the movement. You know, this was uh, quite, quite something. So now um, uh, we see what is really happening. Actually, what happens is, is what we don't see is more significant, what we see and what we are aware of. Yeah. For both of you, what did you learn? What are the big lessons of this Corona time? What will you change in your artistic and aesthetic practice? Anna, maybe you start. What did you learn and what will you change? Um, I learned really a lot of th things, um, as many people, I think, but what I understood that I need some change because uh, how we lived before the pandemics, that was nightmare, I think, at least how I lived. And we need to change something. I, I need to change something. Maybe I should uh, do less and to... Uh, to dedicate much more time to to good ideas, best ideas, yeah, 
Of course, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic time also offered some uh, new ideas which are not connected with pandemic. For instance, our organization started collaboration with Lithuanian National Opera and Ballet Theater. We are going to uh, make co-productions with them together. And it, it, we already did an open call for independent artists. And I think it, it is quite a, uh, it, it is quite a big deal in uh, our performing arts scene when independent small production house cooperates with the biggest national opera house. So I'm looking forward to what, what will come out of this. And uh, uh, many things are still going on. Uh, I develop our organization, but I really know that I will need to change something maybe in my personal life, my, uh, my attitude, uh, my, uh, uh, my tempo maybe of doing things. Yeah, so I will change something for sure maybe even this year. Me? <laughs> There's a good saying in Lefein, a very old saying. My sister told me she is like six years old. It's about tomorrow that it never exists and everyone believes in it. Uh, yeah. I started to, it's about tomorrow. She, yeah. she said to me, I guess what I'm talking about. And she says, it never exists and everyone believes in it. You know, it's tomorrow. tomorrow. It's a very old thing. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've, I've learned to appreciate time for all this uh, period personally uh, as a human being. And I really love time. I really like to devote time for things separately. As Anna says, not to rush, you know, it's horrible to rush. It's, it's such a luxury that you can give to yourself. It's time and you can always find it, you know, and it's so important and everything needs time. That's what I discovered. And in art wise, I probably am not going to change, you know, I will do the same what I do, you know, and uh, uh, the whole idea of this interdisciplinary is the interdisciplinary technological change doesn't scare me. It's going to take years until it's going to change. The new generation, the generation alpha, is going to adapt it very easily. It's going to be very dry and technologically based, so they're not going to be scared, you know. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be great, you know. I just hope this war between the uh, someone is going to change, just finish soon, because I feel somehow that there is an invisible war happening and we will have more and more viruses coming in a sense. That's what I'm scared of, you know, but uh, this political change, but I'm trying not to think about it too much, you know, it's just mm -hmm. conspiracy ideas, you know, that can overload. And artists, we're gonna adapt, we're gonna find a way, you know, cinema is thriving, Netflix is thriving so much. We're gonna, we're gonna find a way, you know, to find the channels of the, of the art, and we're gonna somehow reinvent the connection between the audiences and performance, you know, eventually in a different ways. So, mm. yeah, it's a, it's a time of change. We will have next week a talk about contemporary theater in Chile. And in Chile, something stunning happened. It was just uh, the vote that was done a couple of days ago. They will be rewriting a constitution for the country. Um, there's a landslide victory of kind of the liberal left forces after, you know, dictatorship and perhaps since the time of Allende, it will be uh, for the very first time um, um, a change where we might think, you know, this is a very good one. It's a very optimistic, something unthinkable uh, last December when the police were still shooting at the eyes of protesters intentionally to shut their eyes out and to calm them down. The same police that a couple of months later shut down the uh, uh, a city again with a curfew, but that we put here only here to protect you for Corona. So this is something stunning. Uh, to close down our section, what are your projects? Uh, maybe both of you say, what are you working on and uh, what are you excited about? Uh, what, what will you do? Anna, maybe you start. Um, we have repertoire for now, repertoire uh, of uh, eight, uh, yeah, eight performances. 
and we are developing around <laughs> if, five. If it works, you can do at any time. Eight you have yes. a proposal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yes, and and most most of them are uh, touring performances, but some are not uh, uh, touring, as they call them, real estate performances, which are connected with places. For instance, Sonic Experience at the Vilna Ghetto, because it's created specifically for concrete space. Uh, beside that, we are developing uh, around five new productions. Uh, we are uh, doing uh, projects project together with Lithuanian National Opera and Ballet House, which will bring also, I think, around maybe three or five new productions. Um, we are releasing new uh, LPs, vinyls. Uh, and we are planning uh, new tours, which hopefully will start in September. We are going to Munich, then hopefully to Prague, uh, then hopefully again to Germany, to Thalia Theater um, mm. in Hamburg. It's very soon. Yeah, so, yeah, and hopefully next year we will organize our eighth contemporary opera festival, NOAA. So we have many huge and ambitious plans, and I hope that uh, it will happen. Yeah, that's great. That people can travel and experience and come to your country, to your city uh, next year. Um, what yes. about Jin, Jin Tara, Dr. Gora Parasi? Um, I think uh, the most exciting very soon project, no, no, it's, it's exciting as there are any other projects. There's premiere in Mars. We'll see how it's going to go. I'm very interested. When will that open? In two months, I think we'll see how the whole digital uh, virtual reality is going to be able to. How will people find out about this? How can they participate? Online, online. I will, I will, I will, I will uh, have event created online, and we will have live streaming, so people can wear VR, or they don't need to wear VR, and they can be actually on Mars on the Mount Olympus. To watch. <laughs> the virtual reality headset you can experience with the virtual reality headset, but even yeah. without on a screen, so you can. Yeah. If the world doesn't work anymore, uh, we can go to yeah. one. To yeah, why not? You know, yeah. like uh, to see the performance. Um, mm -hmm. So that is interesting experiment that we collaborate. And uh, another, like quite a big project in Hartford University in fall, in October, I think 25th. In the US, Hartford, Connecticut? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I'm doing an exhibition of five large video projects of pagan gods. Uh, uh, kind of referring on the Fanian kind of Adventist search for nostalgia, you know, for the historical events that never happened in this in the particular generations, you know, like going into the uh, paganism and doing other many things, establishing into your routine in search of your identity as Lithuania. It's a big theme. It's a very sensitive theme for us. So I'm developing six or five pagan gods. The picture of it, of, of, Again, of, of them. Five big? Five big gods. Uh, video, por video portraits. Yes, video portraits of five big gods. So it's kind of the modernized version, you know. And, and it'll be five uh, very big screens where you created visually changing material that discuss the identity of things that yeah. happen. Okay. No yeah. performance, not a performance. No, it's going to be an exhibition of five portraits, and we will we will do a lecture. Uh, also, uh, it's it's like a collaborative work between university and me, and I will lecture and I will work uh, closely with the actors and different other departments. Just again, experience this interdisciplinarity work uh, while creating these video projects. So that's that. And uh, in Lithuania, there's going to be a very interesting project in September in Kaunas. Uh, we, there's a very interesting festival that I kind of got to know this year. It's called House. So the festival chooses one small old house with a historical kind of a factor and they recreate, you know, different performances in the house. So this year they chose me and I will recreate this whole idea of being um, female in the world and experiencing thing from the female eyes and uh, I will recreate these ghosts of mine all these uh, bad and good thoughts into the portraits of latex vacuum uh, and they will stand as a ghost in different rooms of the house so I'm looking forward for this very much so and uh, we're developing a few other ideas but uh, 
you know, I could go on and on. So incredible what's happening there. We are all so focused on here, all we hear from Germany or Munich or France or in London, but you know, the world is a big place. There are great, great traditions out there and great work. What you guys do, the Baltic region and at the moment in New York, also Gundiga. Laivina is visiting from Latvia. She's a curator. They kept a festival open uh, during Corona. She does, they do extremely important work. So um, it is truly a region um, we all um, should know uh, more about it and we should um, um, focus on it. So really um, thank you uh, um, all for, for, um, for joining us and for being with us. It's an um, important uh, moment to really hear uh, more and to um, be um, aware of, um, of theater in the world globally. It is so vastly different uh, to hear that you all keep on working, um, that you are able um, to do um, all this. This is just, um, this is just stunning. And uh, we really am happy that, um, that we could uh, get some messages uh, from the planet Earth uh, uh, during the times of Corona. And, uh, and I think it is inspiring. Um, um, what you um, what you do. So um, I hope it, all of us you will join you will join us tomorrow and on Friday here um, on Siegel Talks. Um, we will uh, continue to hear um, from around the world, and um, we um, look forward to continuing our relationship. Most probably also over the summer um, with HowlRound, and they have been such a great partner and an important uh, partner um, for us. So. Um, I think uh, it is a contribution to that discussion as we heard today, something we would not know. Um, we saw we will have Carrie Perloff, the great American director, legend as a producer, um, and uh, also um, as a, a directing artist, one of the very few uh, women who, who work in the field successfully over, the, over decades and have put an imprint really on um, on uh, the American theater. So this is a, a, a great uh, a thing to hear um, about uh, uh, um, changes that are happening a long time ago in times when also things looked in difficult, dangerous. And I can't wait to hear what she thinks, uh, how she's experiencing um, this time and, um, and uh, what she, uh, what she uh, will uh, tell us about. And then we will hear um, uh, from uh, Chile, as I said, um, um, uh, on, uh, uh, on Friday. And um, this will be an important update from playwrights um, and producers uh, what, we are, what, we are, um, what we are doing here. Um, and so I think you all will be uh, able uh, to join us and it will be with uh, Martin Valdez and, um, and his collaborators um, in Chile as he's working for Milo Rao and for um, the um, uh, München Festspiele. So um, I talk uh, to you uh, too soon. And I'll please thank you to everybody. Thank you for listening and um, all my best. And thank you to listeners for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.